This is the official Winning Time podcast from HBO, Hyperobject Industries, and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm Rodney Barnes. I want to build something special. The Los Angeles Lakers select... The entire league is on the verge of bankruptcy. Irvin. With me, it's going to be exciting. Magic. Our girls, they won't cheer. They'll dance. Johnson. It's showtime! Hell yeah! This week, I'm talking about all things Episode 9. First, I'm sitting down with the amazing Sally Richardson Whitfield, who directed this episode. Then, we're going behind the camera with our cinematographer, Todd Van Hazel. And finally, we're diving into this episode from an actor's perspective with a conversation with Wood Harris, who plays Spencer Haywood. But before we get into our conversation, you know how we get down. Let's recap episode nine. The Lakers are in the playoffs. Only problem is the team had such a hot regular season that they clinched the first round by. From a competitive standpoint, that's great. But from a ticket sales standpoint, it's bad for business. So we lose money by winning. Welcome to the NBA. Meanwhile, the coaching situation is a mess. The doctors have cleared Jack McKinney to coach, but does Jerry Buss go with him or stick with Westhead and Riley? Who's it gonna be? I think we ought to sleep on it. And Jerry Buss realizes he's losing his mouth. Just as she predicted, he isn't strong enough to handle it. But whoever is. Right now, the machines are breathing for her. What can we do? Keep her comfortable, as long as you decide. Lastly, Spencer Haywood's struggle with drug addiction has gotten worse, forcing the team into a tough decision to keep him or cut him. That's where we're at. The finale is right around the corner. But for now, let's talk about Episode 9 with director Sally Richardson Whitfield. Sally, welcome to the show. Well, I appreciate you having me. I love uh, having you, Sally, because I love Sally Richardson Whitfield. I do. (laughs) You know, I never And I love Rodney Barnes. I never knew that this would happen this way in my life. (laughs) I've truly made it because I get to sit here and talk to you, and we'll probably talk again today at some point. (laughs) Um, the bridge between being an actress and becoming a director, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it, you know, it's funny. If you had asked me probably about, I don't know, 15 years ago, uh, do you want to direct? I probably would have said, no, I just, maybe I'll produce, you know. Um, it wasn't really something that was, um, in my mind. And I was doing Ava DuVernay's first film, I Will Follow. And during that process, Ava at some point looked at me and said, you know what? I think you're a director and you don't know it. Mm. And I, I started thinking on it and realized I was that person who always said at the monitors, that I was always asking questions, that I always did think that way. And, um, and luckily I was on a TV show uh, called Eureka and I was able to, of course, first do the work, go shadow some people. Ava gave me some books and stuff and did, you know, um, and the show, uh, gave me an opportunity to do it. And from there, after doing that first episode, it kind of clicked and I went, oh, not only do I like this, I get it. So you get the call for winning time. Right. What's your first thought? Because you have a relationship with the Lakers in regards to being, well, I won't say being from L.A. Are you from L.A.? No, no, no. I'm from uh, Chicago. But I do know, you know, because I'm a golfer, believe Mm -hmm. it or not, um, I know a lot of athletes through golf. Okay. Um, So, you know, I know Byron Scott. I know, I've known, and I know Magic, through being being an actress, being in L.A., knowing, you know, knowing Magic and Cookie and knowing Norm and Debbie, you know, I, I just know them from being around. But I was more, you know, for me, okay, first of all, you tell me it's, it's you writing it. Um, <laughs> but also it's Adam McKay. Mm-hmm. It's um, a different style than I've ever done before. I do love basketball. Luckily, I played in high school, so I know it enough. And you know, for me, it's a new challenge. It, it's, it's, 
every time I want to, I'm trying to grow and I want it bigger and better. It's the Lakers. It's the period. We're shooting on film. It's HBO. All of those things were exciting for me. One of the challenges um, I'm empathetic with, with any director that steps into this role on this show is you have one side of the cast that has a lot of experience. Then you have another side that this is like their first gig. Do you have to approach actors who are less experienced in a different way than you would with actors who have a lot of experience? Absolutely. (laughs) And sometimes it's a learning process. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people have weird quirks and issues that you don't know that they have. Listen, part of directing I have found, especially on shows like this, there is a dancing game that directors have to do. There is a uh, a bob and weave like in basketball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like how do I, um, the, the veterans sometimes just need a small note of, hey, can you pace it up here? You missed this one beat here. It's just about fine tuning it. Some of the other actors have no idea what they're doing. And you really have to talk them through what this means, where you need to go here. Boom, boom, boom. I found Quincy to be really amazing in the fact that you could, even though he's very green, um, you really could give him a roadmap and go, hey, uh, there's a scene in the airplane where he has this amazing, um, you know, he has this monologue. um, And... um, is that the golden time of day when yes, he's singing? Yes. Yes. Oh, the horrible singer. And, <laughs> but he came in um, and he was doing it well, but you know, it was like, okay, you have that, but we need to go here now, and then you need to bring it down here, then you need to pace it up here, then you need to do that. And he really is was able to digest four to five different notes. And then other people, you know, you have to maybe be a little slower. You have to figure out what buttons you can push, which ones you can't. Sometimes you're pushing buttons that they don't want to be pushed. And as a director, you have to go, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to keep pushing this button because I need a certain reaction. I'll just have to pay for it later. So it's definitely a dance. So taking that into consideration, for the Wood Harris scene, Uh did you have to prepare Wood in a particular way or... No, Wood does his own. You know, Wood is a veteran actor. He's been doing um, it a while. But still, and I think Wood would say this, I still had to push him. Okay. And Wood and I know each other, so I felt a little more comfortable to do that. But there were times where I challenged him. So how does that challenge, what does that challenge look like? What does that feel like when you say challenge? What are you looking for? What are you trying to pull out of? I don't feel it yet. Okay. I don't care what you think you're giving me. Um, everyone else may feel it, but I know what more there is in you to give. And right now, it's good. Mm-hmm. He, he's never bad. Right. right now, it's really good. But... I know there's I know there's this spot inside of you you haven't touched yet because I don't feel it in me. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to push you until I get it. Even if you don't like me right now, even if you <laughs> yell at me, even if you think I'm wrong, I'm going to push you till I get it. And I feel, and that one take I'm talking about, I felt it in my soul, and I said, we got it. One of the scenes in particular in episode nine, the scene with the death of Jesse Buss. Where's all my money? <laughs> Some night. <laughs> yeah, just like old times. <clears throat> yep. You still pass out first. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mr. Seagram's has way <laughs> with me. <laughs> <sighs> oh. You two go back without me. I'll just die here and haunt the place. (laughs) How about you live here instead? You know, the offer stands. I can get this place on the cheap. (laughs) You have a habit of following your heart. And you hate that about me. (sighs) Just jealous. Can you talk a little bit about getting 
a veteran legendary actress like Sally Field to a place where she's comfortable and in moving into um, playing deaf. Hmm. Well, Sally has been doing this forever. Mm-hmm. You know, she's she's worked on this. She's come up with her character. She's got it. Um, I think, though, I was very happy that there was a point when we were, it's, it's when we're at the pool, mm-hmm. and we were doing the scene, and she, I was able to go, okay, you are, we have to have a, a middle spot here. You're not sick enough because you're going to die this, la- like, right after this, or you're going to go into a coma. And she felt like she wanted to do it some way, but I kept, you know, I'm looking at my DP, and Todd, I'm like, I don't think it's right yet. And so I go and I give her a note, and I don't know, we had just started, we had just been working together that first, that was our first day. And I said, I think you need to be a little weaker when you first wake up. Um, And because earlier you were here and, you know, and she kind of was pushing against that a bit. She goes, okay, I'll do it. I'll see if I can make it work. (laughs) And me and Todd, you know, Todd uh, Ben Hazel, our, Mm -hmm. um, our DP, after the take, he's like, that's better. That was it. And I went up and I, and I thanked her for taking the note. And she thanked me. She goes, no, thank you. You're right. And listen, I couldn't, I don't need to do nothing no more ever again in life. (laughs) I was like, Sally, (laughs) because I also knew earlier there was some other stuff. I just left her alone. You got to know sometimes when to leave the veteran actors alone. Just do a few takes. They're going to find it. You don't need to note them to death because then they're irritated with you. Well, you had three generations of buses that day because you had Jeannie as well. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about the juxtaposition of having three generations within one scene? Um, I had a lot of fun in that scene because everyone needed their own guidance. Like for Jeannie, it was more of a don't forget you're having fun with them, but don't forget that you're envious of that relationship because you didn't get to experience that. So just add that layer in. He had this, this... Uh, this left eyebrow of his that just twitched like crazy whenever he was bluffing. He had no, no poker face whatsoever. You should know that. You've been away all my secrets. Well, I've never played, so. What? What kind of father are you? A good one that doesn't teach his children how to gamble. Wait, you have never taught her play a single hand of cards? No, only Monopoly. They were improv a lot at the top of it to get that humor and that laughter. And like you said, we're coming to the end of the season. They have this beautiful relationship that they had already established. So I would I, I, I feel that that was kind of one of my easier scenes with those three actors because everyone knew who they are, what the relationship was, and what that scene meant. So, Sally, in regards to... Um are female characters who, to lesser or greater degrees, have a lot of weight to carry, certainly in episode nine. Did you feel a maternal sense of responsibility towards them? Well, I was kind of happy that I got there at a point where Jeannie is starting, we're starting to see Mm -hmm. the inkling Mm -hmm. of who she will be, who we all know she turns out to be the strength mm-hmm. and the leader. I like I felt like I was there at the right time to go, okay, I need you to man up a little more. Mm. There's this job. And I know I could do it. I know I'd be great at it. I want it. What are you waiting for? Because before this, she's been a little more vulnerable, a little more daddy's girl. And now we got to push the buttons and see that just that twinkle in her eye and determination. And I feel like I'm, I was part of helping her get there. And then on the other side with Claire, we've always seen her so strong. And it was an opportunity to see a little bit of her vulnerability that we'd never get to see. Um, so I, I, did, I feel like I had an opportunity 
to help help those women get to those other sides of themselves that they hadn't necessarily been able to do yet. You've said to me several times how much you enjoyed directing Maurice. <laughs> <laughs> Who that Maurice guy? <laughs> <clears throat> and just the <laughs> level of depth and strength that he brought to the set. He's always kind of upstaging the other actors. That's true. <laughs> Sally. Thank you for being on the show. Something tells me I'm going to see you soon. I don't know what that thing is, but I really appreciate you coming in and sitting down and having this wonderful conversation. Uh, Thank you, and I uh, hope everyone enjoys Episode 9. I think they will. I think they will, too. So, you know, I've done a few of these podcasts, these winning time podcasts now, and most of them I've done joyfully. Today is a little different. (laughs) Today I'm doing this under duress. So for those of you who don't know who Todd is, Todd is director of photography for winning time. But maybe you can tell from the tone of my voice that there's an issue between Todd and myself. And I think as a cathartic exercise, it would be good, Todd, for us to talk about what said problem was, how it happened, how it went down, and why this lack of professionalism on my part right now is being displayed. I'd love to address the elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. So from my perspective, you know, it's very important to me as a director of photography, one of my primary concerns on set is to make sure that the actors feel ex- very comfortable and that they're given like a scenario to do their best work. And mm-hmm. I looked over and I saw my friend, Rodney, who I forget was your first day. It wasn't my day, first day. But for me, it was it maybe was, the first. Yeah, it was the first time you, I worked with That you, we had worked together. That we worked together. And I saw you standing there as an actor. Up to this point, you're very, like, confident, boisterous, like, you you speak well. And I saw you Thanks. standing there as an actor, and you mm-hmm. seemed a little nervous. You seemed a little vulnerable. I was terrified. And so I decided to, instead of making you feel better, <laughs> I came up to you, and we started talking about the blocking, and I was suggested, uh, you know, maybe it might be better if you come over here a little bit to the right, and mm-hmm. let's try you here. And I basically blocked you behind a door yeah, <laughs> You're yes, completely you did. Yeah, you did. hidden from the camera yeah you did and yeah, you i did. was like okay i think that this will work really great and then i went back to camera <laughs> and 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 the part that hurt the worst is i believed all of this shit for a minute and then i went hey wait a minute i'm behind the door and then you got this look on your face much like the look you have right now very mischievous like ooh, i got one over on rock and i was hurt it distracted me i didn't perform as well as i could have But I was intent ever since that moment in that day to get revenge. And having you across from me now is said revenge. I know. I know it is. Okay. In my defense, Uh I'd like to say that, like... There's no defense. I realize that your love language is by, like, giving people Uh shit and, like, you know, Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. that's your way of Mm -hmm. showing someone that you... That's what it is. Exactly. So I was trying to use your love language back at you (laughs) in your comfort zone. That's a good one. And I was surprised. I was shocked that you didn't take it as such, but I also Mm. realized it's probably Mm -hmm. because you felt so vulnerable Mm. at that moment. Uh, In all seriousness, um... One of the characters of the show, uh, in my opinion, is the look of the show. It's a beautiful show. And even though you might not be the nicest of human beings, (laughs) you're incredible at what you do in regards to cinematography. And so I'm sure a lot of folks out there are really, really curious and interested as to how all of this came together. The look, the camera. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I mean... The look of the show came, I think, at first from the script, and it came from me and Adam speaking about the script. Uh, There's, like, a tone in the script I think is, like, uh, sarcastic and self-referential and has, like, a lot of joy in it, and it really takes, like, a joy in, like, bringing this time period, this, like, cultural moment to life. And I think from the beginning we knew from the script that the show was going to be pulling real archival and photos of the period and very famous events. We've been calling it like a cultural, American culture mixtape. As we know from the scripts and from the show, like this was a time of immense change in America at the time. And a lot was pushing to change both in race and gender and in capitalism. And a lot of the problems that they were dealing with back then, we are still dealing with, Mm -hmm. which is so frustrating. 
And also there's been all this immense shift. So I think the image wanted to hold that amount of like shift and excitement and push and pull and violence and all of that. So for me, that came from like presenting a tapestry for the audience of images, of collective cultural memory, of commercials, pop culture, movies, of these very famous mythic icons as we saw them then and as we are now seeing them in a new way. That's also why the show looks hopefully not like um, vintage film formats, mm -hmm. but looks like footage from the period that has been sitting on a shelf for 40 years and has been found and wasn't actually that taken care of. And we've like desperately tried to get it back to be watched, you know, like it is actual archival. How was, you know, not having a relationship with the game prior to the learning curve when it came to shooting basketball? Certainly because we're not actually shooting basketball. We're shooting story within basketball. Talk about a little bit that process because I know it wasn't seamless. You know, it wasn't yeah. the easiest thing. Yeah. It was like any other, like, filmmaking process where, like, the key to it is understanding the beats in the script and then figuring out how to physically capture those on camera. I mean, the hardest thing for us in the beginning was how to figure out how to get a camera to stay physically close with these players so that we could like emotionally understand what was happening to them, but move at the speed of the most impressive basketball of all time. I mean, the key for us was figuring out this rollerblade operator and having John like come in is a, extreme sports operator. Talk about that a little bit, because so, it's true. It was a unique thing. It's unbelievable. I mean, we, you know, we were talking about, like, dollies and steady cam and cranes and, like, tools that could possibly keep up with the play, but none of them can physically move at the pace of the game. My key grip, David Richardson, recommended to me, hey, you should check this guy out, John Like, He's, like, a rollerblade extreme operator. And uh, we brought him in, and we basically gave him a little 16-millimeter handheld camera, and he had his rollerblades and a little backpack, and he was able to fly around the court and, like, keep up with the play. I mean, For he, hours. For hours. For hours. I mean, we started blocking him. He was, like, another player. You know, yeah. we'd come in and see the plays, and then we'd talk about how to integrate him into it and do we need to adjust things so that he doesn't run people over, you know, and he can, like, slingshot around a play, follow a pass, land in a hand, go up to a face in a close-up, you know, come around for a slam dunk. I mean, it really was, like, the secret weapon, I think. Your department, all of your guys, the team, they seem like the happiest, like you guys operated like a really, it was very cohesive. It was like really a unit, really like a family. You want to speak to your guys, speak to the team a little bit? I mean, I, we had the absolute best crew of beautiful, kind, caring human beings who are so good at what they do. I mean, like very talented artists. I mean, it felt like you guys have been together for years. A lot of us have, you know, right. and then anyone that came in, you know, was brought into that family, you know, and like shown that way. I mean, I think you have to like show by example that mm -hmm. like it, that it, we are here as a family, but also like this is a safe space to like try things and make mistakes. I mean, there's this phrase that uh, that I love using that I was taught by a director I work with named Bridget Savage Cole and, and Daniel Crude, who did a movie called Blow the Man Down. And they would say on set to their actors after we had got it, they'd say, okay, this is the dare to suck take. It's dare to suck. We have it. Try it. Dare to suck. And I've started using that with crew, you know, with my operators or when we're lighting something. Like, I think it's amazing to remind people like, hey, we're here. We've got it. Like, you're free to try. You're free to fail. You're free. Like, if it doesn't work, we won't use it. Like, this is something I learned from McKay, too. He'd be like, if it doesn't work, we won't use it. Especially like the actors talking to camera. Like, right. try it. Try it in the medium. Try it in the close-up. Try it in the reverse. Like, if it sucks, we'll move on. Like, but how else do you discover interesting, new, special things unless you have that safety net to try it, you know? I think people have to be reminded that because I don't think that culture always exists on set, especially no, in TV. Does. But for me, I was like, let's, that's, you know, that's not what, we're here, let's try things. We're doing a crazy show with a crazy style and like the scripts are crazy and the cast is incredible and like we're shooting it this wild style. Like we have to try things, you know? So I don't know. I think once people feel safe to do their best work, magical things can happen. This is true. Um, so I remember one day uh, we sort of made a little connection. It was about a particular scene and it was the scene with Spencer Haywood where Spencer Haywood was uh, connecting with Kareem in a moment of vulnerability where uh, something bad was about to happen to him. And he pours his heart out, and he tells the story. 
He tells a story about when he was coming up in the Deep South and what happened to him. And what happened to him wasn't necessarily just physical. It was emotional and psychological. And it spoke to how a lot of people have been beaten down to a point where they accept that they're on the bottom rung of humanity. And I thought Wood did a great job with that scene. But I thought you guys did a great job at capturing the visuals and the pain and all the emotions. And when we pull back, when he's leaving the room, all of it just fit so well and so beautifully that it was just one of those moments where you stop and you realize um, you actually reach the potential of what a scene could be on all the fronts, from the writing to the acting to the look of it. Everything just sort of fit perfectly. And it's just one of those moments that as a, um, certainly from my side, from the writing producing side, you sort of yearn for. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I mean, I felt the same way shooting it. I mean, I think that reverence for that moment was felt on set. I mean, I think for us, it was time for a show that's so loud and whose style is so at the front. We knew that it was time to quiet down and Mm -hmm. just put the camera in the right spot and let the script and these brilliant actors do their work, you know? And Sally, Sally Richardson Whitfield, you know, also guiding the ship. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And it was time for the cameras to just listen and be in the right spot for it, you know, and have that respect and that sensitivity and that empathy in that moment because it's so painful and it's so complicated, especially for two men at a time where I feel like these things weren't talked about. It's like very, like, difficult for men in 1979, 1980, I think. It, it's a weird time for sure because black men were sort of still trying to find our way. And it's not a period like right now where people talk about mental health or going to rehab yeah. or those types yeah. of things. They weren't necessarily on the table in that way. So you sort of had to find your way, regardless of what class distinction you were in in regards to money or whatever, that trauma, that pain, you were sort of left on your own and men didn't talk about it yeah. in that way. So yeah. yeah. I think the primary visual thing going on for me in that scene is those close-ups, mm-hmm. is their faces and it's their skin. And it's the skin like texture and tone, which for me is one of the most important things visually in the show. And it, it has less to do with like black and white mm-hmm. and like skin tone. It has more to do with like skin um glow and texture and like that humanity in it we did a lot of tests with with makeup and hair and wardrobe to make sure that um our characters of all of all our races had like a a certain amount of shine in their skin for me it's something to do with um like a level of humanity uh that needed to be apparent in their faces and in the images especially when a lot of like the male characters are going around kind of like beating their chest and doing what you were saying which is like in dealing with their childhood traumas, Mm -hmm. uh, like compensating by, you know, accumulating wealth or Mm -hmm. power or ego stuff, right? So it's important while... Could you think that's the thing that's going to make it better? Yes. And it never makes it better. It doesn't fill the hole. Yeah. Which is such a big theme for the show, right? exactly. Magic and bus is like trying to, you know, you're climbing Glory Mm -hmm. Mountain, but it doesn't fill the hole inside. Right. You know, Uh, so I think seeing these people as beautiful glowing, imperfect human beings while at the same time watching them parade around, you know, with all this iconic power, whatever it is, ego stuff, um, was like the big thing for me in skin tone and texture and how to light them and how the makeup should feel. So in that scene for me, it's all those two men in those close-ups. So the Ikigami, or as I would hear you say in your very shrill voice, uh, (laughs) the Icky. Maybe we should do it with the icky right now. Uh, Can you talk about the icky a little bit? The icky (laughs) is my favorite camera of all time. And I think Adam McKay would also say that it's become his favorite camera of all time. Uh, I mean, it came about because we we tested a, a ton of vintage cameras. And we found that no matter how many cameras we tried, it always came back to the Ikigami, the true camera from that time period for all its imperfections. And it's like... You know, it's like the the lights melt and swirl around. And I mean, it's just got that thing that you can't replace, that you can't mimic, you know. Um, 
So the basic workflow became outside of like using it to replicate basketball TV footage and replicate like news footage was that we had two main cameras on 35 millimeter. And then our third camera was always either eight millimeter or the Ikigami. And they were always shooting every scene. We had, oh God, I think we had like seven bodies. The problem with these cameras is like in searching for them, like they've been sitting on shelves for 40 years. Half of them didn't turn on. We could never test them before we purchased them. So my first AC, David Edsel, was finding them in like old warehouses and owner operators, private owners. Usually when we bought the cameras, they would show up with like little uh, news logos on the side because they've been used. Like there was like a WNBC. But um, anyways, half of them didn't turn on. Half of them that did turn on looked insane. And a few of them that turned on and worked looked really special. So we had our favorites. We had our favorite was named Ziggy because mm. he, he brought the glam. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we had Captain, who was like the reliable one because Ziggy sometimes was uh, would have a little temper tantrum. Mm-hmm. Um, we had one called Music Video, which w- looked insane and could only be used in very specific moments uh, because it looked like it was in the middle of a really bad cocaine binge. Um, and, uh, you know, we had to protect them on set. They couldn't really look at bright things for too long or they would uh, malfunction. Um they were like our very sensitive little children that we had to take care of, but that were uh, giving us gifts every day. Todd, someone's telling me that I have to thank you for being on the show. <laughs> so I'm going to thank you for being on the show, Todd. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for sitting here, talking to me. You're so welcome. It really, thank you. It's been really, truly such an honor. Thanks, buddy. You're welcome. So my next guest is a legend. I think even the word legend is too small. But he's also a great friend as well and somebody that I truly, truly respect and am honored to work with. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Wood Harris. Hey, thank you, man. That's very, very nice of you. Come on, man. Thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you for playing our Spencer Haywood and bringing honor and dignity to his distinguished legacy in the game of basketball, professional basketball. What we were looking for, I remember Max and I talking about who Spencer Haywood was um, to the game, how important he was, the nature of his journey, the nature of his arc, uh, not just as a player, you know, his personal issues, but also, you know, the political stuff as well and everything that was under him as a person and what we were kind of focusing on as a character. Mm -hmm. And we needed someone who could truly embody all of that because it's not it's not a simple thing. I think you make it look so seamless and effortless. Could you speak to what it was like for you, how you connected to Spencer Haywood, and then the journey of playing Spencer Haywood? Yeah. Um, being cast in a role, in that particular role, was awesome. I remember talking to you on the phone and the night that it that it went mm. through and we talked. And I just love the fact that you know, it's a, a very challenging character. So I feel like the more challenging the character, the more likely you have to start thinking about somebody like me or you have to think about a different class of actor. Yeah. Because um, if it's a role anybody can do, you know, anybody yeah. can get it. And exactly. so I feel really um, blessed to get such incredible opportunities because they really are challenging. And then delving into the role since he's a real person you had to delve into his life and got to know him. I got, I know him now. I talked to him yesterday and uh, it's a challenge to play a real person that's alive because they want to know what's going on. And winning time is not necessarily just about him. Right. They have to understand someone like the great Spencer Haywood, how I would deliver him. He was safe in my hands, you know, like I felt like I was going to be able to um, do my best and make everything work that we, that you and I, Rodney, and the directors mm-hmm. and the producers were, 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 were building and putting together. And I didn't want to compromise the real man. So, right. you know, I, I can't wait to see how he just responds, you know, 
But so far, so good, though, you know. So ah, far, yeah, so yeah, good. Yeah. Like One of the things that, you know, I was, I really appreciate you for was in the beginning, working with Dr. Solomon Hughes, I remember we went to dinner and he was so nervous and because, you know, he was meeting you who you're one of his heroes. And you were so gracious in working with him. And I wanted the two of you guys to get to know one another because, you know, it, it's sort of when you have a dance partner, one who is incredibly experienced, sometimes it can help convey an air of confidence to the one who isn't. And I think that idea, certainly a light was shined on that idea in the scene in episode nine where you find out that the team has let you go. I was born in the barn on the same dirt as the pigs and chickens. The only thing that separated us from them was these right here. Extra bone in each finger. My Auntie Harriet seen him and went wild, touching him, said, uh, that boy is blessed. That boy gonna do some, that boy gonna do some great things. But along come Old man Quinn, field boss, high yellow nigga. Quick sight, you think he uh, a cracker, but he worse than one of them. Used to whistle uh, with his pinkies in his mouth. <whistles> and just like that, our backs was bent. Shit, I think the first real sound I ever heard was a whistle. What was important to me in that moment, and to Max as well, was that we weren't speaking to addiction from a place of just an addict and somebody who just wanted to get high and feel better, that this brother was pushing down trauma, uh-huh. that he had gone through a lot, he had felt a lot, and in this moment, all of it was just coming up. You know, we were, we were getting an opportunity to hear not only the story, but the, to feel the pain. And you you were incredible in that moment. And Solomon was as too. And it was no easy task to play off of that. Mm-mm. And I think he did a fantastic job. Incredibly proud of him as well. Um, if you remember that moment and how you felt, I would love to hear what you were going through when you were in that moment. I do remember the moment, Rodney. It's a powerful moment. You know, and not, not not what I did, but what was on the script, what you wrote. And so I approached that scene carefully because I just, uh, the, the, I didn't want to mess up what was on the, what was on the page. Um, and I wanted it to be an easy day. Uh, it might be emotional, so I want everything else to be easy, you know. Right. And I, I had to carry what was heavy. So... And I know Solomon, who I love Solomon, by the way. Mm-hmm. What a great person he is in general. Incredible brother. And um, Incredible. he is a fantastic listener. And you have to be relaxed enough as the actor in that moment, in those moments where it's uh, you want every pause to still be connected to the richness of the material. Right. And so, um, I mean, I start preparing days in advance. The first thing I just memorize it by rote. So I could say it like this if I want to with no emotion at all, and I'm just remembering it, blah, blah, blah. And then I go into the next stage, which is to hear it, like uh, musically, and then to try to feel it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm doing days in advance so that when we come on the day of, uh, we could do that, like, easily, you know, so that we can do, like, two takes, you know, I right. think we did like two two or three takes. We did. We did like two or three, and I think there yeah. were a few pickups around it, you know, but it was, you nailed it from the beginning. I mean, you could feel it mm-hmm. just watching it at Video Village. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you're entering the Spencer Haywood story, because he enters the show at one point, you know, and he exits at another point. And is there any way that you could speak to that character arc and understanding that journey and just speak on it a little bit as to where he enters and where he gets out? Yeah. Um, with a human being, it's, there's a lot of complexities. So a start, a middle, and an end are complex. And, you know, in acting, you know, when you're introducing a character, 
is such a big deal. You know, it's kind of like the first line that you read that keeps you reading. So when when I'm introduced as a character, especially Spencer Haywood, I kind of want you to like him, even if he's a bad guy. He could be a killer on the street. I want you to like him because there's nothing more powerful than having interest in a person based on liking them. You could write a role, Rodney, for some guy that's a serial killer, right? And I'll try to find the humor because I need to I need to be able to feel like he can laugh. Otherwise, I know right. I'm doing one note. Exactly. So, so coming in, I want Spencer to be, you know, we start to unravel things. You start to see what, uh, why he may have uh, an issue. Because right. if, if, if I don't do that, you know, you could just have an, uh, a character you don't have sympathy for or you yeah. don't even care about. So I feel like uh, when we when, in episode nine, when I'm delivering that information to Solomon, it's so necessary for people to have a heart for him, yes. have a heart, because now I'm going down this road that is easy to criticize. A lot of people probably don't relate to the addiction he had. When I talked to Spencer, because uh, the day before we did that, you know, I didn't like to talk to him all that much because I wanted to focus, uh, but I needed to get nuggets from him. And so when I talked to Spencer the day prior, he gave me uh, information without even knowing it that settled me into the delivery in that scene. In that scene. And um, it became easier to do for me. It, it, it became, at first, when I saw it, I was like, wow, this is not easy just to put it to you that way. Right. Uh, it's not easy, you know. It might look easy because, you know, it's, it's like being a great basketball player or anything. You're making it look easy. Right. But... But it's years of hard work under it. Man, a lot of, a lot of hard work. Uh, and then you have to ignore everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. Ignore everybody. I'm ignoring Solomon, Sally Richardson, who is... The director, yeah. Man, she was... Awesome. She directed nine and ten, I think. Yes. And I'm just ignoring everybody so that I can make it through that day easily and um give up what I need to give up to the audience so that they could uh accept his declining spirit in a sense. So the biggest thing to me, and you accomplished it in a fantastic way, was that we connected addiction to trauma and not just pathological behavior, mm -hmm. that this was a human being who experienced a lot and was trying to push down his pain with his with the substances that he was mm -hmm. taking. Um, that part was important because I felt like it humanized him. And, you know, for African-American culture sometimes, I think it's almost like somehow it's, it's portrayed as we're lesser in some way. Mm -hmm. because of addiction. And we're not. We're just, you know, there's generational trauma, there's personal trauma. And oftentimes when you look at inner cities or places where there's no infrastructure, mm -hmm. you have people who are desperate. And poverty, to me, is one of the most significant forms of racism mm -hmm. that causes people to hurt. And when you mm -hmm. hurt, you want to feel better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of that, whether... It was about specifically Spencer Haywood, but it was also pushing out from that idea anybody who had gone through trauma in that way mm -hmm. would look for something. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be food. It could be anything. But mm -hmm. at the bottom of it, on the foundation of it, is pain and hurt. Yep, 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 yep. They say hurt people hurt people. And so, exactly. You know, once you see how the hurt person got hurt, in a sense, yes. what traumatized him or her, now you can accept the human being and his flaws or her flaws. You can accept their, accept their flaws, though you may not relate to addiction. You know what I mean? So right. you wrote something deep. And so I just, I just love the material a lot, man. I really did all of the material. And also, it's not all the time you get to be in a period piece. You get to look like, you know... Teddy Pendergrass or whatever. I got the hair. <laughs> <laughs> One of them beards that go right here. I, my yes. beard don't grow like that. His beard yes. grows right here. So um, I loved all that. It was. It, it, it took me away from Wood Harris. And the most I can be outside of myself, especially when I'm being a real-life person, 
the, the more I can be away from me, the script, right. the wardrobe, uh, the uh, general aesthetic. Yes. Man, the better, the better. At the end of episode nine, you know, we've gone on this journey and it is certainly a turning point for Spencer Haywood. Um, what exactly would you like the audience to take away from this moment at nine going into 10 for the journey of Spencer Haywood? Most of what I want to happen, I want to happen for Spencer Haywood. So what the, what, what, what the general audience takes away from it, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think about it. There's so many things. They might go in so many directions. Uh, I hope that they accept him and his story, his background, and uh, are thoughtful and understanding about people like him who don't have it easy. He told me personally that what, what spiraled him down was the Supreme Court. That fight to get into the NBA mm -hmm. was what put him in his path, is what he told me, and made him vulnerable so that he could be that person uh, right. who would use the substances. Yeah. So I, I more care about how he feels because that's a right. revealing thing. It's based yeah. in the truth. I want him to love the portrayal of himself. More than anything, I want him to be walking around with his chest up like, did y'all see Wood Harris? He killed that. And he was, I feel like he was me. I just want to be, I want him to be so happy. And even though I'm showing, you know, a dark side, I want him to feel good about the portrayal of him on the show. There's a so, lot of light inside that darkness, though. Yeah. And I, that's what I want to come out. I want people to just to love that dude and to look into who he is even more, you right. know, um, based on the information we give. I hope people go, man, who is this dude? Like, right. I want to know more about him, you know? I think on a major stage, you know, in this type of setting, um, people have heard the name before, but I don't think they understand the significance. They don't. Oh, and he paid a big price, too. Like he his, did. His he sanity did. was tampered with, even though he's fine yeah. now. But he definitely had to go through a, a pretty toxic journey. You know? yeah. He also was a, a phenomenal basketball player that we're yes. not really talking so much about. Like, exactly. You know, they need yeah. to know, you know, he was that Jordan dude. He was that guy yeah. married to a model Dating. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah, of that yeah. stuff before of Cats that. was doing that, he was doing it, and he's still kind of young because he yeah. was only like he was fresh. He was out of high school and one year out of college, I guess, one sophomore year in college. Yeah. So he yeah, was yeah. a nineteen-year-old, maybe twenty-year-old yeah. person. So now yeah. he's only in his early seventies. He's and he's a fifty-year-old, seventy-year-old. You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, God bless him. You know. Yeah, conscious brother too. Very, 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 very. With that, thank you, Wood Harris. Well, thank y'all. Thank y'all so much, Rod. I'll get back to Cali, bro. I'm going to look you up. Thank you, Wood. I'll see y'all later. Love you, brother. Hope to talk to you soon. The clock is running low, but before I let you go, I want to share one last thing. That painful team meeting happened for real. The brother has a problem. You can't just throw him to the wolves. Maybe somebody can just keep an eye on him. This is the pros, not daycare. The Lakers ultimately decided that Haywood wasn't fit to play and ousted him from the team. What's also true? Haywood actually did take out a hit on the Lakers, though he eventually called it off. But to me, the Spencer Haywood story is much bigger than any of those facts. It's an example of how trauma can fester for decades, and how drugs can feel like the only way to keep the demons off your back. Haywood was born into difficult circumstances. He was raised on a farm in Mississippi, where no one expected him to amount to much, but he defied all odds. After one season of playing for his community college, Haywood joined the USA Olympic basketball team, then went on to play in the ABA, and finally made history as the first NBA player to be drafted without playing four years of college ball. Despite all that success, he couldn't outrun his past. I have to imagine that the fateful Lakers meeting was really tough for everyone involved. No doubt, many of his teammates understood his pain and why drugs felt like his only option. What we don't show in our episode is that Spencer Haywood actually did go to rehab and wrote a book about his battle with addiction and how he was able to turn it all around. 
He was one hell of a basketball player, averaging 20 points and 10 rebounds throughout his career. He was inducted into the NBA Hall of Fame in 2015. Thanks for listening to the official Winning Time podcast. And a special thank you to our guests, Sally Richardson Whitfield, Todd Van Hazel, and Wood Harris. You can watch new episodes of Winning Time on HBO Max Sunday nights. Our final episode comes out May the 7th. See you then. This is the official Winning Time Companion podcast. And it's a production of HBO, Pineapple Street Studios, and Hyper Object Industries. Our executive producers are Harry Nelson, Claire Slaughter, Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna Weiss-Berman. Our lead producer on the show is Jess Hackle. Aaron Kelly is our managing producer. Shaka Mali, Jonathan Shiflett, and Elliot Adler are our producers. Darby Maloney is our editor, and our engineers are Davey Sumner and Jason Richards. Production music is courtesy of HBO, and you can watch episodes of Winning Time on HBO Max. HBO Max.